Welcome to Iowa, where not everything is corn and soybeans. Here at the Sustainable Iowa Land Trust, we have farms that are growing fruits and vegetables, nuts, and managing livestock across the landscape to save our climate. We're permanently protecting land to grow healthy table food. So this is one of our farms, and one of the ones that was lucky enough to be chosen by a poet that you're gonna be able to experience in this anthology. We wanna thank our farmers and our poets for anthologizing this beautiful land that we're preserving forever right here in the heartland. So we hope you enjoy this anthology and I welcome you as the founder and an executive director of the Sustainable Iowa Land Trust. My name is Susan Aram and come on by anytime. Redfern Farm. Corn is not the answer. Then what is? Chestnuts planted into the rich soil at Redfern Farm, two miles from where the Mississippi River flows, where the Paleo people lived 10,000 years ago, mammoth hunters whose points you've held in your hands. Then the archaic people struggled with droughts and dry prairie, giving way to the mound builders and the Oniotos, living in pine forests along rivers and streams. The last prehistoric culture giving way to the Iowa, Meskwaki, Sac and Fox, Ho-Chunk, Blackhawk and Sioux. All who broke very little ground, who kept no livestock, who kept the earth in place, in a place where the sky was black with migrating pelicans, ducks and geese, diving down to fish in the wetlands, with the turtles, frogs and snakes looking on. It's for the bird's sake, for the sake of all who preserve this land, for the sake of the native people, the native prairie, the sake of all the settlers and sons and daughters of the homesteaders trying to claim a home, trying to make a buck on free land, land parceled out to anyone who could stick it out five years. For the sake of the sons and daughters of the sons and daughters who stayed for generations, push to expand to do what they were told with tillage, chemicals, and yields, trying to get big before they had to get out. But you wouldn't be told, and the chestnuts began to grow. And so did the heartnuts, hazelnuts, honey and aronia berries, Asian pears, carnelian cherries, and hardy kiwi vining up the sides of trees. And so did the persimmons, sweet, mild, rich, and picked in the early fall. The days still warm, the fruit still hard, ripening off the branches, tasting like an apricot, maybe even better, smelling like sweetened dough with a dash of cinnamon. Too soft to slice, simply cut in half, the flesh scooped out for a smoothie, a compote, a dried treat, a pudding or upside-down cake with the pulp mixed with flour, baking soda, nutmeg, cloves, chopped pecans, and lemon zest. What? No delicious apples? No Bartlett pears? No, nothing to be pruned. No vegetables? No broccoli, tomatoes, sweet corn? No, nothing to be dug up, turned over. Only asparagus or horseradish that comes up all on its own from year to year. And for the future, no annual crops, an easement in place, protecting the farm from the bulldozer, lasping back into row crops, the speculator with a housing development or a theme park with flashing neon signs and rides and slides, shooting screaming teens into an artificial lake. Only perennials, Drowning in trees, bushes, scrubs that will grow well in this changing climate zone. Who knows what the future will bring? Thirty years from now, the persimmon may find the weather too tough. Now that's pretty extreme, the land trust had said. Yes, yes, that's extreme, you said. We are extremists. The papas, too, are extremists. Extreme in their beauty, the maroon flowers drooping down, producing a massive amount of fruit on a single stem. The green bounty, quietly camouflaged, understated, hidden beneath its leaves. 
The Quakers of the farm, like you, their owners, mild in manner, mild in taste, custardy like a banana crossed with mango. Unlike apples, peaches, and pears, the pawpaws never cross the ocean. A native tree familiar to the Meskwaki, the Sac and Fox, the Ho-Chunk and Sioux. A lucky find, a food source for the settlers. But good for only two days. Pawpaws never hit the road, never shipped across the country. No one ever picked them and put them in their pocket for long. So the apples, peaches, and pears pushed them aside. And the pawpaws went way down yonder. Yet here on Redfern Farm, next to the chestnuts and persimmons, the pawpaws bear witness. Greet Bosnians who cross the ocean, fleeing war, recreating their old world custom of picking nuts in the fall. The Bosnians pull into the Yupik farm in their vans with buckets and baskets. Their vehicles fill with just a little of what they left behind. The nut wizard whirls across the ground beneath our feet in this ever-shifting place, tree roots sinking in, communicating through an intricate web of fungi, growing around and inside them, telling the dirt to stay put, stopping it from washing down river, from carrying harm, finding no one, nothing, displaced. Exercises in Impermanence For Will, Adrian, and Jupiter Ridge Farm, 2022 The wind here is fierce, and Will is nervous about the trees overhead. He gives us an antler and tells us how the mice, in their endless hunger, devour them each spring. The wind and water and mice provide daily lessons in impermanence. Clothes are drying everywhere. How their fingers must have ached from the cold. They have just replaced the broken washing machine. I imagine them, load after load, as the demands of the land mount, and guests, my daughter and me, make their way toward them. The farm is at the point where the Dakota Sioux, Bokoji, and Illini tribes converged, if maps can be believed, if maps can show things like people converging. There are debts here that can't be repaid. The ground is black where they started small fires to keep the big fires away. A man named Steve built the house and the large shed himself and then gave it all away to strangers. Will brings us a stone hammer, round and so big I can barely hold it with one hand. Wrap my fingers to the notches someone created in it. Who knows how long ago, but certainly before 1837, when the people were all forced west. There are countless nicks on the surface, evidence of years of use, probably generations of hands, generations of work. I try not to think of its last owner leaving it behind, of the emptiness of his hand, a stone hammer now in his chest where he can't claw it out and smash everything that needs to be smashed. For 185 years, the land held the hammer, longer than most of what we consider permanent, until Adrian spotted it, at first mistook it for an animal skull until she felt its weight. 185 years to pass the hammer from one hand to another, the land holding it as it holds everything, our dead, our hunger, our dreams and our seeds. Will and Adrian honor it with work and with a silence that is rich like the earth where the fire has blackened it. Devastation, yes, but beneath it, hope greening still. This is a double exposure, a form poem that contrasts two paradigms of farming and it is called the ravine and the organic farm. Beyond timber, discarded cars smoldered. Today, hay softened and saved garlic. Their bodies scattered like hidden boulders. Brome wandered to the edges of the creek. 
tea kettles, ice boxes, rusted mattress springs, morel mushrooms, wild ginger, columbine, coils, coils of barbed wire, mason jar rings, coneflowers, honeysuckle, and grapevines. Back then, refuse was erosion control. Now, buffers protect plants, hands pull burrs. Back then, fires melted tires, farms ate coal. Now, bundles of garlic cure from rafters. I am Rebecca Wee. I am reading a poem titled Begin Anywhere on behalf of the Silt Project at Phoenix Farm in Iowa. Begin Anywhere. On the unspooling pale gravel roads then, with last autumn's milkweed husks waving us on to the end of Strawbridge Road in Iowa. Begin with rapid creeks crawl through this stretch of Midwestern spring. The air sparkles with goldfinch, sparrows, and wind. Begin then with wind and what it carries. In the rippling ditch grass, one tulip's red cup of light. To the left, a swath of small suns in the grass. So start with weeds and the drift of your feet, how they raise small clouds from the chalky road. There's no one to greet you, just the descant of 63 acres of coarse and tended pasture, trees new and seasoned, hills stitched with itinerant fence line, insects so small you won't see them, a rooster's midday alert or oblation, then a nest of blue eggshells and open beaks in the beams of a bridge. Begin writing them down. Don't hassle the robin or massive oak that's worn the weather for 100 years. Begin where you stand, unruffled, alert, in a burnished hour with this wonder you've come to, a bit of earth doing its thing around you. Begin with how happy you are. Tender. Words by Dana Maya. Animation by Palma Maya Johnson. Tender as in one who cares for the pigs, the sheep, and the delicate eggs. Tender as in how to touch chamomile, peppermint, nettles, alfalfa, soft skin of strawberries. Tender as in the word for payment asked and payment offered, each open hand receiving. Tender is soil and cell, culture and coin, farm keepers, food eaters. Keep tending, keep tending. Keep tending. Hi, I'm Mike. I'm a conservation technician, and today I'm here to talk to you about Downey Salmon Federation. I'm here at our Columbia Falls facility, right on the mouth of the Pleasant River. See the falls behind me? At Downey Salmon Federation, our mission is to conserve wild Atlantic salmon, other sea-run fish, and their habitat. Based in Washington County, we work towards restoring a viable recreational salmon fishery while protecting scenic and ecological resources in the area. DSS Land Trust plays a crucial role in seeing our mission through, conserving over 6,000 acres of riparian habitat, vernal pools, wetlands, and salt marsh. We encourage the community to interact with the land we protect. Whether it's hiking, camping, fishing, boating, or birding, there's something for everyone across our many preserves open to the public. Partnering with local landowners and other organizations, DSF has permanently protected over 45 miles of river and stream where the last of America's endangered Atlantic salmon and other sea run fish still breed.
gnawed down, wasp-wasted, two-and-a-half-foot trunk on a six-inch pedestal. Our guide has a bet with a colleague on when the tree will fall. Not where. It will fall in the river. Beavers know their business. There it will lie, disrupting the current, and the beavers will feed on its twigs at their leisure. Elvers, swimming upstream in the spring to spawn, will navigate around it. A big trout will lurk beneath the trunk, trout memory whispering him to wait for nymphs drifting with the current, Elvers swimming against it. Here, in this protected bend of river, land and water have dominion. I will bring my grandson here when he is angry and afraid in the wake of his parents' turbulent divorce. Here, no human will disrupt the flow. Columbia Falls Like an ancient castle lost on a lock, there the pleasant meets the tide. A defunct fish ladder and a great dump of granite blocks thwarts waves beside an eroding degenerative power station. And for boys, now men, balance among the remnants remains a dangerous ration. From the bridge above, a safer watch for smelt beckons as waters gush on tidal flats increasingly hidden beneath the cold rush of Greenland melt. Will tomorrow's render yesterday's ever again? Better to push upstream to a quiet tributary, like the grills, even if they'll not return. Find a rise and cast about like an angel stripped of wings, grounded to the autumn floor. How does one stand vested to experience where the flitting of an eyelash is an epoch, where the micron of a micron measures the present? Faced with such lineage, an albatross chained around the neck how can one not cave into himself like a slow collapse of folding chair back down to a barely remembered dawn and the even more unknowable black hole that is the future? Does it hold a heartbeat? The scourge of our species is Despite self-laceration, we cannot help but rise again into the shuttered sunshine, lean heavy on our walking sticks, and trudge through the yellow staghorn, the upright forest, between the glistening Caesar's Ammonita, until we reach the bank of that tributary. Look down where clean, yellow-filtered clovings along the bottom of this silently moving brook give solace to the grieving. At what point is a human parasite too much for even the natural world to recover? Asking for a friend. Into deep forest this west river pushes me. Wind skims its surface into aged flesh, tobacco into smoke. The trees ask, how can they trust again after so many false promises? How does the healing take shape, sitting in red Windsor chairs among Lanterns with globes encapsulating dragonfly carcasses. What does this new healing look like after sleep, after resting? From hands that poured subsistence decades ago, 
kerosene congealed with age, what promises were made and broken. Hearth is heart. Stubborn determination equates caring with we haven't forgotten. Keep the fire going. Remember relationship. Dragonflies, glass shard wings, mirror fragments. Reflect September's sunsets. For grandchildren to hear how the mosquito sings. Since 1983, the Peconic Land Trust has worked with the community to conserve Long Island's working farms, natural lands, and heritage. Over 13,000 acres have been conserved, including working farms, such as Quail Hill Farm in Amagansett, shorelines that protect our communities from the impact of climate change, such as Real Point on Shelter Island, buffer land that protects our ponds, bays, and tributaries from surface runoff, such as our Smith Corner Preserve in Southampton, and so much more. We hope you enjoy the inspiring poems by Scott and Lori collected within the pages of Windblown, and that you find time to explore the beautiful and meaningful places that land trusts throughout the country are conserving and caring for, with your help. We could not do this work without the support of many, so from all of us at the Peconic Land Trust, thank you. We look forward to seeing you soon. Laird at the Croft by Scott Chasky As rough stone sharpens steel, a man walks under the hill through wet grasses to tilled field. Hoe in hand, hand to wood, layers of loam sing, rain, sun, leaves, woven with weed, red root, purslane, lamb's quarters, and ocean's strong song, tool of conduct, hoe, hickory shaft caked with soil and cool tendrils, work, breathe, sharpen steel, feel this stone ground to loam with glacial water, woven in grass and silt, a fertile earthen intelligence. Postcards from New Roots Farm. I drove across New River Gorge Bridge, one of the highest in the country, spanning one of the oldest rivers in the world. The bridge was built the year you were born and two years before my parents met. That is, the bridge is and is not that old on a human scale. The poorly named New River has seen it all, retreat of glaciers, the Shawnee forcibly removed, partition of West Virginia from its eastern neighbor, birth of hellbenders. I stopped at the abandoned house on the road leading to the farm. Its ghost stood in patient lace at the window. Two young white women farmers, Kate and Flannery, the latter an English major, of course. 
walked with me through drifts of shin-high snow toward greenhouses they'd built with local lumber the year before. The greenhouses were limbed with tiny lettuces, arugula, abundant rows of spinach and kale, all summer in a humid plastic hut. They showed me the rows of garlic they planted in the fall. Kate leapt up on seeing the green scapes just breaking through the surface, coffee nearly spilling from her mug. The sky was empty. Everything was written on our hands. Earth gives up its warmth, but the wind is still ice. I walked downhill toward the pond through fallow fields, except for the places where a local farmer plants hay. A century ago, this land was breeding ground for pit ponies. The ponies lived in the coal mines and were hoisted above ground in summer. When the mines shut down, farmers raised cattle and pigs. Kate says that if you don't make hay, brambles grow in the fields. Just like you, land drifts back to self-protecting wildness. After our morning at the farm, I hiked down and back up the Kaymore Miners Trail. I slid over slick stone. A falling icicle nearly got me as I took a picture of the waterfall. Under rhododendron leaves, I imagined Carter G. Woodson at 17, reading newspapers to black miners shrouded in coal dust. In return, they would buy him ice cream and tea. At the entrance of the mine, a sign remains. Your family wants you to work safely. There are 764 steps to Kaymore Bottom. The mine shaft is now filled and fitted with iron bars. I think you might like it here. The mosses, the shadows, the elevation gained and lost. These poems are in honor of Long Hungry Creek Farm, which is an organic farm in Red Boiling Springs, Tennessee. And the farmer is Jeff Poppin, who is the father of biodynamic farming in the Southeast US. So these poems celebrate his work to maintain his land and also the things he grows on it. November, Long Hungry Creek Farm. As the sun plunges through a vortex of clouds, the blue, Autumn sky becomes a canvas for the light, for the wind, for the air itself as it brushes over the strands and stalks of sunflower skeletons, the air itself a messenger of distant galaxies of nitrogen and carbon, of water and dust and pollen, all manner of stories and songs sent earthward from the moon, the stars, each oak tree translating, each pea shoot and radish leaf transmuting the language of life that rings through this whole grand universe to the silent earth, shifting its fine silica as an ear, as a mother who leans in closer to her child in order to hear. Meadowlark Hearth, Part One, Tiny Lives. Rows of tiny babies reaching for light, for life, for love, love from sun above, which with water gives them life. Garbed in green and green remains until maturity when buds burst forth into blossoms and glory is revealed. Divine growth process and fruit of the plant begins to appear, concealing, nurturing seeds for next life, which cycles on. This one place is part two. Under cottonwoods, tall, gnarled, stately guardians, through bushes out flat to the river, also flat, meandering, wide and slow. One feels steady, constant pace, this land of sand. These trees for centuries have watched humans pass, one civilization after another, marking the land its own. Currents change again, eschewing chemical promise to more natural ways, old and proven combining from wisdom once dismissed, but proved needful and essential. Farm takes new form, while chickens roam in colors and cows low as wind blows through trees, branches, grasses. <clears throat> Part three, Seeds of Life. 
Caesar the germ, the life behind humans and their many civilizations from time before. Seeds carry the past into futures. Meadowlark Hearth Farm preserves renews seeds to carry on, trusting future times to be. A venture of hope preserving precious vintage seeds, year to year renewing life to continue. Seeds. It's all about seeds. Hi, I'm Leona Sevic, and I'm here to share with you a poem that I've contributed to the Writing the Land project. Uh, many thanks to everyone involved in this uh, just uh, amazing project, uh, especially Liz, and, um, and also uh, to Kelly Walker and her husband Dan. I had the great pleasure of spending some time with Kelly and uh, having a look at her farm in Amelia Courthouse, Virginia. And uh, that land that she owns currently was gifted to her by her father. Uh, who made it a priority to pay off the land, to give it to his children, to do with what they would. Uh, and uh, Kelly has special plans for that land, uh, which will be held in trust. So I dedicate this poem to Kelly Walker and her family. Farm, sell, give. Wiping dusty hands on work shorts, she settles into a straight back chair smiles broadly. My father knew what all of his children would do with their parcel of land. I have not met the others, but to me this small woman, her blue eyes smiling with interior light, has it right. She will gift this rich land to a family who will raise their own clean food. Red and black Angus, Egyptian walking onions, meat hens, radishes, carrots, comfrey. She is the giver, or rather, the giver back. Pastor trained, she will gift these green pastures, white owned but black worked, to the descendants of the men and women whose tired hands pulled all they could from the soil. Can you see it? She asks, flushed and alive. I swivel to look, think, yes, I can. Yes, I really can. Thank you very much. Hola, my name is Catalina Mari Cantu, and I'm an indigenous Mexican Madeiran poet that has created three poems in a homage to Suthchakochi, later known as Whidbey Island in the Salish Sea whose First Nations consider her to be a living being. These poems were created in consultation with the Snohomish tribal people from South Whidbey and a historical specialist. One, the land who I was. I was homeland to the Chihupshi Snohomish, the first people who shared my island meadows. Field birds built nests among my bracken ferns, jade nettles, blue camas, and black mountain huckleberry. I was home in every part with a purpose. Bracken roots ground into flour for bread, nettles for medicine and dye, with its rope bark rolled into two-ply string for fishing and duck nets. Camas bulbs harvested like potatoes, huckleberries dried. I was homelands where my Douglas fir, western cedars, and hemlocks touched the sky on a hill above my lower meadow, a forest for longhouses, canoe building, and storm shelter. Past the forest, a clearing with a creek for family living and ceremonies. Then another forest where the deer, elk, and bear were hunted for food, their skins good for Northwest winters. I was homelands with a buffet where a short walk to saltwater clams, crabs, ducks, birds, and salmon. A bounty shared by first people in harmony with my nature. We respected and nurtured each other. After every fall harvest, fire cleared my lower meadow. The winter rain extinguished the flames. 
I was homelands for tens of thousands of years. We believed it would last forever. Two, the land who I am. Stolen from the children who played in my meadows and climbed my trees. No one asked me why they should not be sent to boarding schools. Sold to a European family to raise cattle. I had never heard the word, yet watch those creatures trample my meadows of bracken, camas, and nettles. Fence my forest that touched the sky and felled with axes and saws, dammed with dikes. Another word I didn't know zoned and divided by a highway, divided again into parcels. My new name, Parcel 2089.235. 10.22 acres, a shadow of my former self, gifted as farmland, planted with fruit trees, ignored. When was I ever a farm? That's the work of my neighbors, South Whidbey Tilth. Least for 99 years, a short time in my history of the meadows vernal pools nourishing my native plants. Three, the land, who will I be? I am still homelands to the Stuhupshi Snohomish, our spiritual connection unbreakable. While the creek sings along my crown without baby otters, Invasive mountain blackberries strangle my meadows. No bracken, camas, or nettles. I watch as deer and rabbit follow their ancestral trails. On my shoulder, a 50-foot hemlock watches and waits. She gives me courage to believe we have a future. Welcome to Freetown Farm, the home of the Community Ecology Institute. Our mission is to cultivate communities where people and nature thrive together. During the summer of 2019, CEI purchased this 6.4 acre organic farm, the last working farm in our hometown of Columbia, Maryland. We have protected this unique property from housing development and are preserving and restoring the farm creating a place where people can learn through hands-on experiences about how to lead happier, healthier, more connected, and sustainable lives. From this farm, we run a variety of intergenerational workshops and programs at the intersections of education, environment, equity, and health. Our initiatives have concentrated on four C's, connection to nature, civic ecology, community health, and climate action. Our gardens grow local food, promote soil carbon sequestration, encourage water infiltration, rebuild soil health, create habitat for pollinators and wildlife, and keep waste out of landfills by composting. With the support of our community and amazing volunteers, this year we've grown over 1,100 pounds of food to donate to our local food bank. On Seeing a Proliferation of Mayapples at Freetown Farm by Laura Chauvin. In Cherokee, its name means it wears a hat. We acknowledge that we are on the traditional land of the Piscataway Kanoi tribe, as well as the Susquehannock, Algonquin, Lenape, Nanticoke, Powhatan, and Patuxent peoples. Indian apple. A single white flower hangs under shield-shaped leaves. Maryland's first colonial governor claimed this land. No treaty can shield the loss of home when treaties can be broken. Devil's Apple. On this site, plantations used the labor of enslaved people to grow and harvest tobacco. Foragers found the May apple, its golden fruit hiding under poison leaves. American Mandrake. In 1845, a landowner freed 17 people he had enslaved, gave them this mandate. 150 acres of land belonged to them. They called it Freetown. Umbrella plant. 
spring ephemeral shading these woods in green. Its names shape the story of Freetown Farm. Freetown Farm Gardens, a Sestina by Patty Ross. There are gardens here weaved in between a road of pebbles. We were walking, Angela and I, heading toward the forest, finding a wood stage surrounded by log seats and children at play. The lush green of the trees drawing us closer, we almost missed her. An Isabella tiger moth or banded woolly bear no bigger than our thumb creeping along mulch chips heading toward the mushroom garden. There are six gardens for eating and few others for healing all our gardens. There is much to see and do here at this free farm, a rain garden of pebbles. Wild flowers fill the space with yellow and pink petals the size of my thumb. Kiera told us a black bear was once among the black cherry trees of the forest. I would have been scared if I saw a bear nearby, but not her. My friend Angela is fearless. Nothing bothers her or ends her play. The homeschool kids have arrived and what is learning looks like play. I remember I used to make mud pies, pretending to sell them at the market garden. We both went to school in Philadelphia, but I am not as courageous as her. Near the medicinal herb spiral, I saw the racinus plant. And still walking the pebbles, leaves with what seemed streaked blood overshadowed the circumstantial forest. Moving toward the plant, I held the big leaf between my finger and right thumb. Wetlands behind the herb spiral have cattails thick and thin as my thumb. And they are singing in this purposeful pond, propagating as play. I never thought I would see so much on this little 6.4 acre farm and forest. Wet lands and their creeping roots sit next to the NAACP garden, where roots conjure up enslaved, moving quietly among the berm's pebbles. I think back to the woolly bear and wondering how many of her have survived the running feet of children overlooking her, while dancing to the children's garden to measure peppers by thumb and watch farm chickens peck among the pebbles for crumbs left from lunchbox sandwiches lost at play. Screams and whispers tune my ears to learning from the Grow It, Eat It garden, remembering when I first became an explorer in the red clay of the Carolina forest. All this history, all this learning carved out of this small forest. I wonder, looking at the big old oak, did you see her? Harriet, you know, all those times she passed through this land of gardens? Did she stop to rest here and lean against you, Oak, leaving her thumb print? Did those following her ask to rest in the lush, to give worry away, to play, to drink from the river Patuxent, calming heartbeats among the pebbles? It's noon. The sun reflects off the forest river and paints glitter on its pebbles that sparkle like squeals of homeschool kids out of the garden and off to play. Isabella, what a pretty name for a caterpillar, no bigger than my thumb.
bended knees. Like the death of the Lakota at Wounded Knee, we scream for centuries the bleeding. In death, their spirits we envy. In lands full of freedom, in earth and breeze, soil fertilized with the blood of our ancestors that whisper in the trees, paper annexing stolen dirt for white immigrants' wealth, white immigrants, black hands, stolen lands. Mixed up mules and crows and miles and acres of land yet to sow. It's happening now, did you know? For the freed enslaved of their mothers, fathers, today there is more bleeding of the offspring of the martyr. All the wrongs are still too white, losing 30,000 acres annually, losing the fight. The losing non-whites by the five uncivilized. My people were mixed, sold, never found. The five tribes built up by pounding the backs of my family down. Where's freedom? At my people's sacrifice. The land will tell you the story. After the rain, after the tears, the soil is one way to turn back the years. Of course, now, post-pandemic, to dust it gets plowed after the trail of tears and trials the loopholes that infect the rest for money money land stepping back on black backs to get ahead in a oppressive system of tactical land theft that is ruled on in precedences at the highest courts my fight is my right against this narcissistic supremacist system weighing in at a six to two vote. I am a servant still, civil, with the land in our hands we hold. We hold on our bended knees, we hold on for 30,000 acres with a good firm grip, disguised as a tax lien, void of conservation and hope, strokes on reserve land, not held in trust, no trust for the predator, I'm coming with a soft voice and a black pen, with my ancestors behind me for the land that was earned, honor the deed once prayed for on bended knees. Country Playground, written by Doris Frazier. That's me. My aunties say, the land loves children as their fans, with their joy, their laughter, innocent exploring hands, running feet, their beat a rhythm, familiar sweet, children understand. My auntie say, back in her childhood day, made trips to her grandparents' farm, men Maurice, touching the land any way they can, running through cornfields with outstretched arms and hands, wearing bare feet, oh, a special treat, sifting gray sand, oh, we were riding the land with gritty footprints and sticky, sweaty hands. The land, sister sun, was blazing hot. Hmm. Stop playing? Not. My aunt to say, echoing, loud, yelling cousins was allowed. Wow. No commands? Stop running? Be quiet? It was grand. My grandparents own their land, my auntie say with pride. All day love playing outside <laughs> in deep country playground, big and wide. As far as I could see, the land belonged to me. Riding in bumpy wagons, we all squeeze and fit. Finding wood, digging holes for the yard barbecue pit. Grandma calls out, time to eat. Our garden was our store. Right outside on nature's floor, ground space was a place to harvest, plant our food, fresh greens and beans, tomatoes sweet, fresh picked berries, walnuts from the trees, and honey from the bees. Mm, my auntie say country summer, fun for me. 
the land, my liberty. Well, for down home cousin, it was hard work, not just play. The land, their life of every day, planting and cropping and plowing and sowing and laughing and loving and connecting and knowing this is my land. Auntie, tell me more about before. And Auntie say, at age 10, planted my own little garden to watch it grow. <gasps> Teach me, Auntie. I want to know. Wild Seed, 636 Rudd Pond Road, once a single family home, became a sanctuary for thousands of bodies, a thousand shades of earth. We painted the house like the sun, plastered the walls with clay, transformed the shelves into apothecary, library, altar. The same house where a dozen Filipino women lay down across the floor, journeying with their ancestors in a circle of light. The same floor where the djembes erupted, laced with liberation lyrics ignited by young black fire. Where we strung waist beads with girls on the cusp of womanhood and held ceremony, concocted medicine, harbored our elders, and cooked food for family on their way back from penitentiary visits with loved ones locked far, far away. Beside the pond that became a shrine for Oshun, where a Muslim father buried his son's placenta and a pagan mother got married to herself. The same pond where we traced a labyrinth in the snow when it froze over. Where we learned how to make our own remedies from the plants growing wild around us. The soil became the ground in which to plant our wildest dreams where we poured libation, scattered ashes, practice magic, where we grew Lenape blue corn and sugar baby watermelons, boiled maple water into syrup, where we stretched our imaginations, remembered our sweetness. The land that was once a single family's backyard, transformed into training grounds, community classrooms, childcare spaces, political art tents, a freedom playground for black trans humans, a space to breathe. The same land that taught us about slowing down to feel everything, about generosity of spirit, about defending what we love, about not giving up. The water that listened to our tears while the beavers slapped their tails and the big turtle swam where we shaped vessels out of creek clay, floated baskets made of leaves filled with flower petal offerings. The same water that taught us about chains, tracing the mountains that taught us about permanence. The same mountains where 18 teenagers climbed together with their intentions tucked in their pockets, where every single one, not without struggle, made it to the summit. And we lay our deep breathing bodies on the sun-warmed rocks that pressed us up against the sky, pledging our pumping hearts to life. The same sky that changed colors, spanning the wide open horizon. Never had we seen so many stars, never so many chances to make a wish as they streaked across the blackness. The big dome sky that taught us we are part of something so much bigger, so small, so significant. We are no accident and we are never alone. 636 Rudd Pond Road, a sanctuary for thousands, once a single family home.
Hi, my name is Hiram LaRue, and I wrote the section in the Foodways Anthology called Poetry X Hunger. I hope you'll take a look at that section because it turns out we've learned a lot of lessons as we've used poetry to speak back to hunger. And many of those lessons are relevant to land trusts as they partner with poets. And as a bonus, the Poetry X Hunger section also showcases some powerful poems by a diversity of poets. And these are all examples of the many, many poems that are now available to fight hunger with poetry. So kudos to Dr. McLaughlin for her leadership and thanks to you for listening and reading. Most of all, here's to fighting hunger, one poem at a time. Bare bones, pallid, salivating on stale air. Inhale, aromatic memories before cupboards were left bare, praying for a meal, but a morsel is barely there. Silent duel with hunger's boastful stare. One country wallows in gluttony, yet another laments in despair if all men are created equal why is life so unfair incessant gnawing deep in the pit of my pitiful soul longing for sustenance to overflow an empty bowl mocking me Looming large, whither I go, trembling hands unmask, pain, my desperation grows. Head tucked low, veiling the shame, begging for food. My God, this is insane. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Starvation is a poison. The antidote is love. Full bellies pass by in quick paced steps, failing to see my hour of woe and regret. God bless the one who grows his own tilling the ground with hands of his native home. Villagers pledge to restore the land, plant more trees, united we stand. Hunger, a silent pandemic raging out of control. Millions go hungry, but who keeps tally of the toll? Swaddled skeletons and emaciated remains, hidden six feet deep, the world in motion yet unchanged. Come, stand with me. Brothers and sisters, let us rise as one. Act to eradicate hunger until global victory is won. Thank you. Hi, I'm John Dutton, and today I'm going to read to you Hunger Visited My Classroom. Hunger visited my classroom every morning during my first year as a teacher. Though it feels like forever ago, I never forget his blue eyes nor his unkept shaggy blonde hair. 
He masqueraded as an eight-year-old boy, dressed each morning in the same ragged, filthy Power Rangers t-shirt. The rings of dirt around his neck and the grime hiding deep under his fingernails were his only companions. His classmates ostracized him as they called him Pigpen after the character in Charlie Brown. Malnourishment attempted to hide behind a mountain of synonyms. Thin, skinny, underweight, bony, scraggy, scrawny, beanpole. The list seems endless like the hunger creeping continually around this boy's belly. Hunger tried to stifle me, however. No matter how late his bus arrived, I always made sure he received his bag of breakfast, containing French toast sticks with syrup that never stayed contained, as I did my temper towards his constantly sticky desk. I knew I could never defeat hunger as he grinned at me each morning, but I could put a dent in him and make sure he knew I wasn't going to take it easy on him. Jolly Ranchers, Lifesavers, Sourballs, and my personal favorite, Werther's Original Caramels, filled the glass fishbowl on my desk. I never missed an opportunity to reward any positive action or answer. I called upon him at every, every opportunity to help with mundane tasks passing out papers, sweeping the floor, walking papers down the hall to the office. The smile on that boy's face lit up my heart. As he enjoyed whatever treat I gave him, on the last day of school, I gave him an entire bag of Jolly Ranchers, his personal favorites. The following year, Mrs. P, his new teacher, and I greeted hunger as he tried to slip silently into school on a brisk September morning. I handed him an entire bag of Jolly Ranchers, and his smile nearly broke my heart. As I watched Mrs. P escort him down the hall and into her classroom, I whispered to myself, not today, Hunger. Not today. Not on my watch. And peace. Thank you for listening. Hunger visited my classroom. I'm John Dutton, and have a great day. Thanks. My name's Ryan Dennis. I'm the founder of The Milk House, an online journal of rural writing. And I have an essay in Writing the Land, Food, Ways, and Social Justice called The Stories We Tell, uh, which is about what is at stake when a narrative doesn't get told and the tangible consequences that might have, particularly in relation to how we treat the land. I just want to say thanks to Liz and everyone else involved in the Writing the Land project that I haven't met, and that I'm excited to be a part of it. Um, not only because it fits the ethos of the Milk House, uh, trying to give voice to those of a, a rural experience of some sorts, but because um, the type of readers the Milk House attracts tends to be those uh, very concerned about protecting land and treating it appropriately. And so writing the land gives these people an opportunity to act and support land trusts that can make a difference. And for that, I, the Milk House, and everyone connected to the Milk House are grateful to writing the land and wish it all the support in the world. Thank you. The ghost of my memories watches and stands still as I walk up this empty hill with native trees, plants, and bare serpentine rock. The light waves of calamity within the pool of grimy water that sits nearby. Its eyes deep below watches closely, twisting my words into every lie I've ever told so grossly. They judge me while I am a continuous, redefining mess 
trying to confine a soul like mine to fit in. As I'm walking deeper, I taste the poison. I try to close my mouth, but my heart is left open. Like the poison ivy I try so hard to avoid, it stings my body until I dig holes into my skin to finally free every sin I ever managed to hold inside my bones. All I wanted was to be known, yet I was never meant to feel their love. I was meant to feel my own. I question who I am because their expectations are the very bane of my existence. I walk further up the hill in hopes that with every step I take, and every bruise that touches my legs, my attempts at earning love serve some kind of purpose. Thorns prick my veins as I step into this rose bush that's missing all the roses. As they peel away this God-forsaken vessel, I hope they remember we bleed the same. For now I know that my significance has always been hidden 